I was thinking about uh, technology uh, about 10 days ago when I was reading uh, about the death of a couple of unicorns, bigger tech plays today on Silicon Valley, and thinking about the similarities back to the dot-com era. This is the, that's the first time when I met Jason Drummond. Uh, we have one clip which we're not going to show you, uh, but which I'll put up uh, uh, on Share Profits, uh, which Jason has dug out of him appearing on Show Me the Money. Uh, you look pretty similar. Actually, I'm looking at this clip. You've actually got more hair now than you did, <laughs> did then. I, I won't ask about that. Uh, but uh, uh, we're both uh, looking, or I'm looking a lot younger and thinner. Uh, Jason's obviously looking now younger than he was then. He's got more hair, but that's another matter. The clip we have here uh, is Jason appearing on Newsnight in 2000? 2000, yeah. Okay, let's roll the clip. You can't touch this. Potentially, how big is this change, do you think? I think I'm, I'm very skeptical. It's very hard to imagine that the internet will have as big an impact on the economy in general. You're seeing really a significant impact, a significant impact on particularly the value chain where you've got, for example, major manufacturers um, selling directly to consumers and directly to consumers. So it's huge. Yeah, absolutely, big impact. You're rather more skeptical. Yeah, potentially. Potentially it's huge, but for the time being, it's tiny, tiny. And Eight billion dollars is less than Americans spend on dog food. About a sixth of what Europeans spend on cigarettes and tobacco products. I think I'm, I'm very skeptical. So when people talk about this as being potentially bigger, bigger than electricity... I'm very skeptical. It's an extraordinary, an extraordinary thing, isn't it? It is extraordinary. It is extraordinary. The huge impact will be in the trade of travel information, in software, financial consulting services, and the music industry. What do you make of the, potentially, the potential scope of this? I think I'm, I'm very skeptical, skeptical about the idea that information technology, the internet in particular, creates a new economy that we'll see productivity growth far greater, far greater than we've seen in the last 100, 150 years. It's an extraordinary claim. Telegraph. Anesthetics, antibiotics, telephone, radio, cars, aeroplanes, jet aircraft, nuclear power. Now, those are things that have had a really dramatic impact. It's not about the technology. I think I'm, I'm very skeptical. I mean, who cares about the technology? What impact does it have on the overall economy and wealth creation and productivity? I think that's where I'm much more skeptical. It's really what it, what it gives the consumers, what it actually gives the users of the internet. Skeptical. It gives them access to good uh, applications and access to good information. Skeptical. And ultimately, it can save them some money, and I think that's what really is driving the internet at the moment. In terms of the initial research, instead of going around to 25 car dealers in the London area, you might do your initial original research by looking at car dealers over the net. Would any of you seriously contemplate doing business? It's very sensible to be sceptical with someone. Uh, electronically without meeting them face to face and face to face. How many of the things that are bought and sold ultimately will be traded via the internet? You're rather more skeptical about whether all these new companies called dot-com really are worth the vast amounts that they're valued in the stock market. It seems to me that we're looking at something in many ways which is comparable to tulip mania. It's an extraordinary claim. Tulip mania. It's an extraordinary claim. A few hundred years ago that these prices are simply ridiculous. I think we should preserve this discussion, record it, keep it somewhere, take, put it in a vault and bring it out again in 15 years time when we can see who was right because someone's going to be very embarrassed. Thank you all very much. I think, you know, in any industry, that there'll be some... Uh, sorry, can you hear me there? Um, there'll be winners and losers. I think if you look at the valuation, if you invested in, uh, in certain shares of, say, Amazon um, and many of the other companies that were doing quite well at that time, you probably have done quite well. OK. Sorry, um, I'll come over to the microphone. I think it's, it's a matter of timing, isn't it? I, I, floated, I floated, actually, the first internet service company called Virtual Internet, on the European Stock Exchange in, in the end of 98. And if you'd invested in any of those stocks that I was involved in at that time, you'd have made a huge amount of money. If you came into it in probably in 2000, uh, it was probably a little bit too late, if I'd be perfectly honest. So it's all about timing, like everything. I suppose the, the, the other, the, another way of looking at it is, 
uh, those guys were sceptical that the internet would change the world. I think we all accept it has changed the world. Uh, we are all prepared to buy and sell things online without me meeting people face to face. Maybe even Jeremy Paxman does that these days. Um, how many of those companies that were around in 2000 have survived? Virtual Internet, which you, you ran, what's happened to it? Well, it's now part of Web.com in the US, a very large NASDAQ equity company. So I'd like to think that pretty much all of my things is still there or thereabouts going. Um, but yeah, there are lots of many, many successes. But the problem is in any industry, um, particularly when you've got a hot market, people are making money, then, uh, then the quality tends to deteriorate. So you get a whole bunch of you know, crap things which may have come on the market, which I wouldn't have invested in. Okay, I mean, we, um, let's bring you slightly close to the microphone right. so that we can hear you. Um, looking back to 2001 or 2000, we agree that most people, if they bought in 2000, 2001, if they bought 20 internet stocks, uh, probably the best performers, they only lost 99% on. Uh, does tech investing have to be that way? Um, and I do this in particular with reference to uh, the valuations we see today for what I refer to as the unicorns. Companies uh, which are completely without, gen not generating any cash, valued at over a billion dollars. Uh, isn't there a, the same sort of thing happening again? Isn't that a recipe for people losing money? Well, yeah, I, th I think um, you've got a number of issues there. Firstly, I, I guess I don't price the, 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 these kind of stocks. It's down to supply and demand. I think the issue with the unicorns is quite interesting. We're assuming because these companies, uh, the funds are investing such large amounts of money in them that every one of them is going to be successful, but clearly they won't be, and they know that. So and that's quite key. I think what you're seeing at the moment on valuation, particularly so-called unicorns, is that you know, there's lots of cash available to these businesses because in the US they want to scale these businesses up very, very quickly and they know that if they invest in 10 of them, if two of them actually work out, they're going to make a huge amount of money. Um, so, I, you know, I, I think ultimately, um, I don't know, I'm not here to really, uh, to, I can't really pass comment on whether those valuations are right. I think what is interesting is it's almost been driven, I think, not by the companies, it's been driven by the investors that want to give them large amounts of money so they can actually fund this huge scaling up. So, to a certain extent, you then have a management team who have got to live with a big valuation, which actually is quite challenging. And certainly you've seen some examples, I know you, you referred to... I'm going to come to a couple of them later. Yeah, later. So are you saying that the current... Uh, I'm going to describe it as a bubble in tech valuations, that you, you're allowed to disagree, um, but the bubble in tech valuations in the US, you're saying, is basically just a product of the fact that we have silly money economic policies, zero interest, zero percent interest rates, money is being... This is a product of quantitative easing, money is being thrown at people, that doesn't say much for valuation, does it? Well, I, I that think, is just a bubble. Well, no, I, I think you know, the valuations in the US are clearly not the same level as the UK. I think there, there are a lot better deals to be done probably in the UK and Europe. Uh, well, sorry, okay, I'll try to do that. Okay, here we go. I'll stop looking at you, Tom. Um, I would say that, yeah, the valuations um, in the US are very, very different to, to the valuations that we're seeing in the UK and Europe, probably a little bit more realistic. I think it's just a function of, you know, these businesses... Um, there are some terrific opportunities out there. You only have to look at the money that's being made in, for example, around mobile, mobile gaming, Supercell or King Digital, um, see that some huge opportunities. And um, I think the investors want to put lots of capital into these businesses and therefore it drives valuation. No, no, but, but you say a lot of money has been made. Uh, ultimately, you make money from a business when it turns around and starts generating cash. I would put it to you that money has been made because one venture capitalist who has got money to burn as a result of easy money policies values a piece of shit company at 500 million and then six months later an even stupider venture capitalist comes along and values this at 1 billion in the next fundraise. You're saying money has been made. Money, it's imaginary money because it's not actually that the business has actually become something worth something. Isn't this just a, this is a repeat of 2000, isn't it? Well, I, but I suppose the same things could be leveraged at, you know, um, Google or Amazon or certainly Facebook. And, you know, Facebook were criticised for many years that they weren't actually making any money. And now we know it's one of the, probably the most successful, profitable uh, marketing, advertising businesses there are. I mean, so we use Facebook a lot in our marketing. So I think it, it's wrong to say that um, people aren't making money. I think people will make money, but they're not always going to get it right. I think the point I'm trying to make is from, a, from the point of view actually coming up with an idea and building a company, 
Um, if you want to scale up quickly, you need a lot of cash to do that. So to a certain extent, the valuation is a function of being able to push enough cash into those businesses that the management is still actually retaining ownership, which is a slightly strange way of looking at it, but I, I look at it from the point of view of, you know, as, as somebody who sort of starts these companies. But, you know, they're not all going to get it, they're not always going to be right, but there'll be one or two that will absolutely be immensely successful. Is there not a danger when you have this business model, which is all about throwing capital in to scale up, the problem is that if these businesses are not generating cash, if when it comes to funding round five, you can't find a venture capitalist stupid enough to put money in at that thing, then you just run out of money. That, so your business plan is predicated on people continuing to fund you through to profitability. But as we found in the last dot-com bubble, when it burst, suddenly the shutters went up. And even actually, if you were a half-decent dot-com with an outside chance of actually generating some cash, you just couldn't get the money. No, I, look, I, I think you're absolutely right. I'm not disagreeing with you. I think what the interesting point from my perspective is I'm probably one of the few people that are still around since 2000. So I guess there must be some sort of sense in what I've been doing. Um, I've never uh, been in a situation where I've, I've squandered and wasted cash. I think, for example, some of these so-called unicorns, this is the first time they've experienced this. They, they've been given a huge amount of cash and huge valuations, and they spend it as if they're gonna, you know, it's going to carry on forever. And one thing I know for sure is it doesn't carry on forever, so you've got to make sure you've got a real business at the end of the day. That was uh, um, one of my memories of the last dot-com uh, bubble, was working for a, a fraudulent dot-com in Glasshouse Street, um, was that the way that the company, the company raised money, and such so great was investor appetite that they raised more than they wanted, uh, the management uh, kindly let investors have some of their own shares, but then because there was so much money, they just proceeded to waste it all. Is there, any fi is there a sense that maybe once again we're seeing companies which will have no financial discipline and this in the long run will be very bad for them? You know, I think you're probably right. That's we've got to be very, very selective. I think if you've got a, you know, billions of, of, of dollars under management, that you can take a few risks. I think if you're investing in tech stocks in the UK and Europe, you've got to be quite, you've got to be quite uh, careful. Um, I, you know, certainly looking at management teams that have had that experience where they've had huge amounts of cash thrown at them. And I, you know, I did a 50 million fundraise for virtual internet in 2000. Um, and I've seen those situations. The trick is just don't waste it. You never know. You know, suddenly, you know, the market, everyone's looking at oil and gas and mining and other things. And no one wants to talk to you. And I probably wouldn't be invited on here. Uh, but at the moment, you know, tech's quite hot again. Um, is it getting overheated? Probably. Um, but you know, for sensible management teams that actually take the cash and do good things with them, you'll get some absolute stonking businesses created off the back of it. The trick is finding those rocket ships that are really going to do something really special. Well, you talk about the trick is finding the rocket ships. So in terms of valuation, one of the things that I don't get about technology stocks is if I'm trying to value a business, I look at old-fashioned things like maybe a discounted cash flow model. When there is absolutely no visibility of earnings, particularly if you are claiming to have disruptive technology, therefore you're breaking into new markets, there's inevitable inertia from customers, uh, Jeremy Paxman won't buy into your uh, new product. How on earth can one do a DCF model, or is valuation just uh, luck? I, you know, I'd like to tell you that there's a real science that goes behind it. I mean, from my point of view, I don't try and look at the, the criteria and how we get valued. Um, that's for the clever people like you and the brokers and the, and the, uh, the analysts who try and work, work that out. I think all I'm interested in doing is trying to raise the money that my businesses need at the right level so that the, you know, the existing stakeholders, the key employees, don't get diluted down to nothing. So in my mind, maybe I'm very unusual, probably the reason I'm still around, I've done all the deals I've done, so I try and create that balance to get the money in that we need, but also to make sure that everyone's making money, including the shareholders but, but who come in. You're talking about getting the money in you need, and we were talking earlier about how uh, you will have one venture capitalist put money in at 500 million, the next one's twice as stupid and puts it in a billion, and people make money. Is there any rational sense in which one can analyze a disruptive technology business in conventional terms? I, I think the or is it just momentum trading, effectively? I, I think it's the, it's the ability to scale. I think, you know, in my experience, when you look at uh, these businesses, it's, you know, the scaling up of these businesses is absolutely crucial, but it's back in the right management teams to understand that scaling up is spending money on marketing, not fancy offices, not on, you know, uh, in structures which can't be supported once the cash gets turned off. At the end of the day, you've got to assume that nothing's forever, and the ability to raise those, that money on those incredible valuations isn't going to continue forever. So the management team that's sensible enough to realise that and actually spend the money wisely. So at the end of the day, they have a business that, that can be maintained without those, those uh, huge influx of cash.
OK, well, let's move on to another issue uh, about technology stocks, perhaps not so much the disruptive ones, but technology stocks in general. Why is it that your industry has such a, a problem with fraud, with revenue recognition, for instance? Well, uh, luckily, I've, I've never been involved in anything of that nature, so otherwise I think you'd have talked about it. Um, I, you know, I think the truth is that um, there, are, there are criminals in every walk of life. Um, some of them go and bank, you know, rob banks or post offices and other just float companies on AIM. Um, so I don't think it's a function of our industry. I think the truth is there are, you know, there are dodgy people out there looking for easy ways of making money. So I don't think it's, it's, um, it's specific on our industry. But, but isn't, I, there, isn't there an issue with a company Revenue recognition is always an issue in software and technology stocks. When do you recognise it? And when you're in a public company and your and your uh, express intent is to show dramatic earnings growth, not necessarily cash flow generation, but dramatic earnings growth, in order to get away the next fundraise, etc. Uh, for technology, there is going to be, always going to be an issue with revenue recognition, isn't there? No, I, th I think that's very true, particularly when they're selling service, a software as a service, and rather than you know. Um, Billing up front, they're billing you know over a long period of time on, on contracts. Um, you know my businesses don't really do that, so I'm not. So, and in fact, actually, if you look at the accounts for any of my software companies, they we tend to expense everything as well. So all of the R and D, we just expense it. We don't try and do anything too clever because I've been around long enough to know these things always ultimately come back to cause cause issues. I suppose as the nature of the business is selling software as a service. You know how do you get the balance right? Um, I suppose if you are uh, if you have a note, your own agenda and you want to raise funds, you want to you know, present something as best you can, then you know, there may be opportunities to do that. Um, I've certainly not been involved in that. Um, but yeah, and I, I think you're right. But you know, ultimately, it comes down to you know, it's human nature. There are always going to be bad people out there doing bad things. Um, the trick is just trying to spot them as you do and, and uh, tell people about it. You mentioned another thing there, which is uh, this capitalization of uh, a, a cost. There are some companies I look at and I see they are capitalising year after year after year. They are not actually making any money, are they? No, and I think also the, the reason oh, but that it's I... Apparent, they tell me, we've got to do it it's under IFRS whatever. We've got to uh, present our accounts in a way which I would say is fundamentally misleading. Well, you know, we tend to expense everything, and predominantly it's off the back of my experience of developing software. If your company is fundamentally um, developing software, it could be apps, whatever it might be, that never stops. So therefore, you know, it's fine. If you're just going to do a piece of work for a year, and at the end, the rest, you know, forever and a day, you're going to be selling that same, that same service and not have to spend any money on software, then fine. But of course, that's not the reality. But that's the reality, is that software, uh, you know, it's, what are we on now, Microsoft 10? Uh, every year there is a new release. You are going to have to continue to upgrade software which was uh, perhaps state-of-the-art in whatever area it was, whether it was an app or uh, you know, compliance software, whatever. something that was state-of-the-art five years ago is almost unsellable now, isn't it? Yeah, no, totally. So if you are selling a software business, R&D is just an ongoing thing. It's ongoing expense. So I, I take the view exactly that, and if you look at the accounts, we just fully expense everything because we'll always spend lots of money on development and just never stops. If it does, then you know, you're in trouble. It's as simple as that, you're not moving forward. So I agree with you. Um, I think probably companies that, that capitalise too much of that development, um, if there is an ongoing requirement to develop, which there will be, particularly in the world we live in now where with the internet everything's upgrading all the time, you don't have old versions of anything running on any, anywhere anymore, then, no, I, I agree with you. I think that would be a warning sign for me. One other little issue, which is uh, it, you operate a, in technology. It's not like making plastic ducks. Uh, it is a rapidly changing world. Uh, we've talked about a product from five years ago which was cutting edge is obsolescent now. How can one see any uh, earnings visibility when the world changes so rapidly? I look, uh, and again, I'm looking at stocks now where I'm being told this stock is a buy because, I, because the analysts have done a DCF valuation out to 2020 and on that basis it's remarkably cheap. I remember the same crap being spouted about stocks 15 years ago. Uh, it, it, you can't do that, surely, when there is so little earnings visibility. Are there products going to get taken up by customers or is Jeremy Paxman going to be the purchasing manager? Is someone else going to come up with a different product which may be either better or cheaper or sold more effectively? There is no earnings visibility, is there? Well, I think what's interesting is that a lot of the disruptive technology companies which are out have obviously been disrupted themselves. It's like quite ironic. Um, so I think you're absolutely right. I mean, we've seen a lot of companies that, in my mind, underinvested in mobile. 
Um, I know, I know, for example, I, I see mobile as a huge you know, big opportunity. So um, you know, I'm investing very heavily in mobile, but companies that just don't have a good mobile offering are in trouble. You know, people are migrating away from the desktop. If you look at Facebook's business, over half of Facebook's customers uh, are now exclusively connected via mobile, and 90% are mixed. So if you don't have a good mobile offering, then that's going to be an issue, for example. So that requires different teams, uh, a different development strategy. It's not just good enough to say, okay, it's HTML5, it works on desktop, it'll you know, look okay on a, on a mobile device. It has to be built, I think, um, you know, native iOS for, for Apple devices. It has to be absolutely optimized. Um, you know, a good example of that was Supercell, which you know, is a developer of Clash of Clans, which is, I think is now the biggest grossing um, uh, app uh, in the world. It's five, five million euros a day it generates. Um, 150 person company in Helsinki, but they were developing uh, a, you know, a range of products around Facebook, around desktop. They then canned the product that was making 11 million a year to build a, 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 effectively an app which was exclusively developed for the iPad, which was Clash of Clans, which obviously has proven to be a terrific, you know, terrific success. So, uh, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think you've got to be very careful and look at their development strategy and just make sure that they're choosing the right, you know, the right strategy. As, as an, um, I, I flagged up what, what I'm as an old person who doesn't understand your industry at all, and I didn't understand a word of what you just said then, but I, I've, I've, I've raised a few things which make me nervous about stocks. You are approached on a daily basis to invest in all sorts of technology platforms and companies. Are there any other things which make you nervous, that are the obvious red flags for you? Well, on a personal level, I do get asked to put money into all sorts of different things. I think history has shown me that it, it's not just good enough to have a good idea. Um, you know, generally, people come to me um, with great tech ideas, you know, an, app, an idea for an app which they think is going to change the world. Um, in my experience, that's just you know, that's a, a small part of the story. The issue is, how can you acquire customers? What's the cost of customer acquisition? How long can you hang on to them for? So uh, if they haven't got any idea about that, if they just come in with a sort of naive view, which is, we're going to change the world with this amazing idea, it just doesn't happen. That's the reality. Um, and that's why I think the whole scaling up in the marketing is quite key. So if someone doesn't have a really decent strategy and really understand the potential customer and the cost of customer acquisition and all that sort of uh, good stuff, then I'm, I, I switch off immediately. Um, it, it sort of makes me think of um, on the AIM market, it's Blur, which may be a company which has a wonderful idea, but it's quite clear that they've been flailing around and they have no idea how they're going to attract so, customers to get them to the stage where they make a profit, which they never will do, they'll go bust, but uh, there's just no idea there, and that's amongst a quoted company. Well, you know, so for example, Fair FairFX, a business I started eight years ago, we've got half a million consumer customers in the UK, we've got about 5,000 business customers. You know, we, I, know, I know literally almost to the penny how much it costs us to acquire a customer, we've got very complicated cohort models regarding lifetime values, and we know what we can spend um, and how we make money out of that. And that's really pretty fundamental to any of these businesses. So if you're looking at any investment, you know, that's for me would be a real uh, problem if they haven't got any view on that. Because a good idea, who cares? You know, there's a million good ideas out there. Making money out of them is a different, different matter. Um, on a personal level, probably the other thing I find is a bit of a red flag is when you get people who tell you how successful they are and how much money they've got and they, want, they need 200 grand from you. And I always find that slightly, slightly strange. I think if you've got so much money or so successful, then why don't you put your own money in? But that's a personal issue. Okay, what, one of the other things about your industry which um, uh, makes me turned off as, as an investor is this idea of the next big thing. I am told that big data, which I've got no idea what that actually is, but big data is the next big thing. So every MBA on this planet is setting up a big data firm and they're all going to be very rich. Isn't um, anyone who talks about either big data or is it the internet of things, the other thing which uh, I have no idea what that means either. That, that to me is an automatic turn off. Have well, I got well, that I wrong? Well, no, I think you're right. I think they're relying on the idea that if they use a sort of buzzword, that you're going to think, oh, they clean up what they're talking about, therefore, they may be, maybe they're going to make Do you think some they money. know even less about what the Internet of Things is than I do? Uh, I think they might know a bit possible. more. But I'm sure they looked it up on Wikipedia and, and you know, it's kind of worked it out. But you know, big data, um, actually, I think big data is interesting. I, mean, I, I came from a background in running web, websites. Um, you know, in fact, we had 250,000 uh, business customers at VI running some pretty big websites for Disney. And we were generating huge amounts of data. So in my mind, big data is not about... Cause that in, I think that conjures up this idea of all this stuff that's got to be stored. The reality is that I think since the 80s, every two to three years, we're doubling the volume of data that we're 
the storing. Big data, in my mind, is all about how you analyse it and make sense of it. So, for example, I think there will be some terrific opportunities. Um, if there was a business that I wish I owned today, it's called Optimove, and it's in Israel. It's a private company. They built some amazing software, which basically you can analyse your customer data. So it comes up with a, a marketing plan for every one of your individual customers. Um, so rather than just saying, okay, we're going to do a Black Friday for everyone or whatever, it comes up with a tailored uh, a marketing campaign for each individual customer. That's the future, and that's the future of big data. So I think there'll be some amazing uh, opportunities there because you can imagine if you go to a large uh, company, an online retailer that's got you know terabytes and you know the most phenomenal amount of data. The trouble is most people don't know what to do with it, and it's people like Optimove which are producing software which can then make sense of that. And they they come from a, a Israeli guy is very smart. They come from a background in in gambling and gaming. A lot of good things come out of that industry. Um, it's a pretty well-developed industry so I think I think there were some interesting opportunities without a doubt because all that data is out there and if you can do just make something you know so you say there will be interesting opportunities but there's also uh, for every opportunity there's 58 companies out there who are saying they're going to make a killing from it well there, there is the challenge and that's what you're trying to work out isn't it but I think the big data is interesting because you know there's a huge amount of information out there and as a, as a large company if you're not using it to your advantage you'll be pretty foolish um, and at the moment most com companies don't do you think most investors understand technology stocks? Do most private investors understand them? No, I think, I think the problem with, dare I say, in private investing is that, I know it's one of your sort of bugbears, that people um, don't necessarily follow any degree of logic and they get caught up in the euphoria of the day or whatever's kind of hot that particular day. I think the fundamental problem you have is that you, know, you, have, you have a very sensible approach to investing, as probably I do, but ultimately, you know, private investors have, have a finite amount of capital. They can't tie up necessarily large amounts of capital in businesses on the long term. So therefore, it, there's a risk that it stops being strategic. It just tends to be sort of following the crowd. The risk of following the crowd, as we all know, is you can get burned. You know, because invariably, if you come in, I had this thing. I have a, a, my personal trainer last week. Um, sorry, I remember. You know, saying you got to me a personal that, trainer. I know it's surprising, it's isn't it? Fighting, fighting the. Uh, Fighting the tide, but you know, personal trainer saying to me, "I've been, you know, I've been tipped this particular stock," and I said, "Look, to be honest with you, if it's by the time it's got to you, this really isn't something you should be putting your money into, um, you know." And there is the risk of that, so it's a slight herd mentality. But it is difficult. Like I can see it's very tempting to think, "Okay, what can I make money on this week, next week? What's hot? What's you know?" When you have people who are heavily promoting things, that's that can be quite appealing. Okay, we'll wrap up now. One final question: the article that I referred you to was. <coughs> about the demise of social day, which is um, uh, social, social day, living. Social, social living, living, yeah. living social, living, living social. social, something like that, which uh, uh, was uh, a unicorn, which is now clearly going bust. It's fired nearly all its employees. It was like Groupon, which did an IPO. It's lost 85% of its money. Doesn't that remind you a little bit of 2003? Uh, well, 2000, 2001. Yeah, no, sure. I think that's right. I was always slightly sceptical personally about the Groupon model. I didn't. I wasn't convinced that it was going to work long term. An investor in a uh, in a bar and restaurant business that was using Groupon quite extensively, and at the point where, where the manager said we don't really want any more Groupon customers because they just you know they get the bare minimum and they never come back, so we're not going to use them anymore. I thought well, that's probably not a business that you want to invest in. So that came down, I think, almost to a more on a practical level. You know, so that's, that's not a comment on technology, it's just the fact the business model I was think rubbish. So. I think that's right, yeah. Okay, thank you. Now, do you have any questions? We have four more minutes. Has anyone got any questions? Oh, oh it's called Optimove. Yeah, if you want to understand, if you want to get your head around um, kind of the, the potential for, for big data, um, go to Optimove.com and they've got a little, oh, no, by the way, I'm not involved in it, some of those Israeli, Israeli guys, but I think that's definitely one to watch. Amazing business. Okay, uh, Jason from uh, Tethers Financial, he'll be on his stand able to talk to you about uh, anything you want to the rest of the day. Thank you very much for listening to the presentation. I'll see you later in the day. Thank you.